So I'm here with uh, Andrew Aquilante, who is the uh, lead driver for Phoenix American Motorsports. Uh, it's a, a Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge GS Class uh, team. Which, uh, races uh, Ford Mustang Mod 302Rs. Uh, Andrew has had a lot of success in both amateur and professional racing. And uh, we thought we'd ask Andrew a few questions just to let our uh, followers on Facebook and other people who are interested get to know uh, him a little bit better and what his uh, interests and uh, thoughts are about uh, the series and about how things are going so far. So Andrew, you, you've had a very successful past year in uh, racing. Uh, you uh, won two national championships in SCCA uh, in uh, both uh, Touring 1 and GT2. You uh, were admitted to the Road Racing Drivers Club, which is a very special honor, especially for a young road racer. I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about your uh, experiences at the uh, 2013 uh, SCCA runoffs and give us an idea of what your experience was like. There. Uh, it, obviously, it was a very good experience. Uh, two national championships during the 50th anniversary of the runoffs was a pretty, uh, pretty good accomplishment. Um, one of those things that planning wise wasn't really on the radar until kind of July, August. But uh, it, it was, uh, once everything started to come together and we ran qualifying and said, okay, we've got a shot at both of them because GT2 was a real last minute idea, very unknown uh, situation. So, you know, it was didn't quite know what would happen until we actually got there and so that was that was really satisfying to win. T1 was a little bit of an unknown due to rule changes from the previous year uh, but using the same car as soon as we kind of knew what we had in GT2 kind of knew what we had in, G or in T1 and that made life uh, work. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about uh, people may be interested in how, you, how it was possible for you to use the same car to win national championships in two very different classes. Can you give people some understanding of how that's possible, uh, the same Corvette being used for both classes? Well, in two, uh, the beginning of 13, the rules changed, and they took what was the STO class and put it into T1 and put it into GT2. Put it into T1 with some differences in weights and restrictors to, to slow it down some. They put it into GT2 unchanged because the classes had previously run pretty much on top of each other. So the, the differences between the car was just waiting on strict control. From a practical standpoint, you can basically switch back and forth from one class to the other work under the hood and a change in the weight of the car. Yep. Yeah, and the weight was not significant enough to warrant changing ride heights sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And plus putting it in a Corvette where you need to put it it's, it's, it's in the center of gravity. So not much changes that. Well, that actually raises another question. You, your technical knowledge of the cars is uh, really evident when you talk about the single car, uh, two classes uh, situation in, in the runoffs. Um, your people may not realize, but you're not only a successful road racer, but you're also a, a very accomplished uh, race car constructor. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how it is that those two skills interact with one another in the day-to-day -day running of, uh, of a race program. How, how do those two things uh, work together, one with the other? I think it gives you a better understanding of what's going on with the car and, and kind of know, you know, when something's up and what to go immediately looking for, um, you know, it's, when you're out on track, it doesn't help you so much, but what, well, I shouldn't say that, what I mean is, is that when you're, it's, it's more to me when you've got issues with the car, but also it gives you a little bit of a mechanical stability idea that you see a lot of guys come up like uh, go-karting wise who don't really yeah they may have worked on their own go-karts but there's so few systems on a go-kart that compared to 
the car, these types of cars that we race, where they're where they're a street car, um, you know, they don't quite have the what I would call sympathy, kind of an understanding of okay, you know, if we're burning up the brakes here, we're going to be creating a lot more work from each other, and plus, you know what, you're only gaining half of a tenth of a second by using the brakes that much harder. One of the things that I've noticed is, uh, you know, from the beginning of my uh, association with you and with Phoenix is the care that you take in terms of how much time you, sp you spend on tracking a given car, how hard you use the car, how many laps you put on it. Uh, it's something that I think a lot of people don't think as much about, but when you have a sense of the mechanical wear and the, the forces that are operating on the car, I think it keeps, especially when you have to repair them and renew them. Yeah, and, and it, you know, and it relates to endurance racing that way as well. Granted, nowadays cars are so stout that you, they talk about the 24-hour races are pretty much done flat out now. I mean, versus 10, 15 years ago, where you had to short shift, you had to do this, you had to do that to preserve the car and not go into the garage. I mean, now winners of those races are, you know, they don't spend time in the garage. You cannot. Whereas before, you know, most likely every car on the track had spent time in the garage being repaired. It was just what repairs were being made and what they were being done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, uh, so I know you've been around uh, a, a race uh, team and in racing garages uh, all your life uh, with your, uh, your family, uh, both your dad and his brother, uh, being involved in uh, road racing for many years. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your early experiences around the racetrack and uh, around your dad and his friends and, and then also your early competitive driving experience, your, how you got started with this? Um, I think when you're kind of around the racetrack when you're a little kid, while you may not be, you know, learning or you may not be paying attention to everything that is going on all the time, you are around it and you are absorbing it, you are kind of watching stuff unfold and while you may not realize it at the time, you are kind of learning about it. Um, I would say that applies greatly to me from being around being two years old sort of thing going to the racetrack. Um, you watch guys like John Henderson and Don Knowles and while you may not quite understand what they're talking about, um, that you absorb it and that sort of thing. So then once you do get out on the track, you kind of go, oh, okay, that's what they were talking about. And you kind of already have it ingrained in your mind. And, and I don't want to say know what to do, but you kind of... Primed to understand yes. it. When yeah, you encounter it, you're primed to understand yeah. it more clearly, more quickly than yes. you otherwise would be. Yep. You also had some pretty good role models as drivers and experience. You know, and, and there's so much more than just going fast out on track. I mean, there's, there's racing is a combination of going fast and racecraft. But, you know, it's like playing chess in a fighter, you know, in a fighter plane sort of thing. You know, because you're doing, you're, you're, yeah, you're going fast, but you're also having to, to move the pieces around the board and figure out where everything's going to end up at the same time. And racecraft. And, a lot of people doing uh, track day events don't quite get that, and, and have, uh, it's a little bit of a shell shock for them sometimes when they go, oh, well, well, yeah, I wasn't fast, but somehow I just went flying off the road from a guy that was a second and a half slower than me, and he won the race, and what did I do wrong? You know, you were up, you were looking at the mirrors, and, and you can't do that all the time, you know, you got to be absorbing what... Uh, you have to absorb all the factors, not just around the track. I guess you know, there's a temptation when you're out there to, to sort of pass what's in front of you and not think so much about the next step or how that's going to work out. It's sort of like the difference. It's the metaphor of playing checkers versus playing chess. You've got to play chess. So You've got to be looking for several, several, several steps, steps ahead. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I, I know you've uh, been involved uh, around the team and then more recently involved very uh, directly with uh, the Continental Tire uh, Sports Car Challenge uh, series. Uh, you've driven in the ST cars uh, in that series and also in the GS cars. Uh, 
And uh, the, uh, talk a little bit about the GS class in, in the Continental Tire and what's, what's special about those drivers and about those cars. What makes it appealing? The, the, the whole Continental Tire Challenge is appealing because you're racing mildly modified street cars. Cars look the look as they came off the showroom. There's not any major aero upgrades that's allowed. You're not allowed to be changing bodywork and putting light fenders on. You know, underneath the skin, while they are a race car underneath sort of thing, you're still dealing with a stock chassis. The suspension points are not moved. While the pieces bolted to the car, in some cases, are reinforced or made for adjustability. Again, it's one of those things where you could unbolt everything off of the chassis, cut the roll cage out of it, and make it street legal, make it street legal again. You know, it's it's not something that is so far gone like a GT car or a two frame car. Obviously, never been a street car. You know, right. it's, it's they 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 are you put one next to its street counterpart without any stickers on it, you're gonna go, what's the difference? Sort of thing. You know, there's some. The, uh, about the drivers and the, uh, the mix of uh, people who are involved in, uh, in the series uh, compared to some of the other driving experiences that you've had. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, you know, the, the drivers are all very good. I mean, uh, there's a lot of guys who are either coming up to the ranks or are kind of old hand pros sort of thing that have been running for years and years and years. And, and that is what also is good about it is that it attracts the high level talent you know, you've got guys like Bill Oberlin, um, Terry Barcheller, Andy Lally, who have been racing you know, throughout the ranks for uh, a certain amount of years, and they've done a lot of stuff. They've, you know, they, they, they've won championships in, in the higher GT events and, and that sort of thing. And it's it's good to kind of compare compare yourself to them and, and that sort of thing. Um, Gives you a benchmark. It gives you a sense of, uh, of your own developing driving skills, uh, yeah. and, and probably you know, on your way up, you now know where you are in terms of your drive. So, Continental Tire uh, Sports Car Challenge includes both the GS cars that uh, that you drive and we drive, and the uh, ST cars. Uh, they're on the track together. They're racing together, but they're very different. Uh, cars in many ways. Talk a little bit about the similarities and differences and what's unique about the two different classes that we So the GS cars, you've got the Mustangs, the Camaros, the Porsche 911 kind of base car, the BMW M3s, that sort of stuff. And then in the ST class, you've got the Honda Civics, the BMW 1 Series, the BMW 3 Series, the Miatas, the Hyundai Genesis, um, and, and, sort of, and all of the Lower performance, but still performance-oriented street cars. Um, a lot of front-wheel drive cars mixed in with the rear-wheel drive cars, whereas GS is all rear-wheel drive. You know, so the, the difference in time on the track is made up on the straightaways. I mean, GS cars are making anywhere from 400 to 450, 475. Uh, horsepower ST cars are making 220 to 275 horsepower, um, and so, but their cornering capabilities are roughly equal because the ST cars usually end up a little bit lighter, but they are on a smaller tire. Um, also, they don't let as much. There are some minor differences between the two class philosophies. We're trying to stop a 3,500 pound. 450 horsepower Mustang. The street, it's street brakes. They allow racing calipers on the GS cars, where in ST they pretty much make you, you stick to the stock calipers, and that creates. ST still very much has that preservation. Uh, the connection to the street car. Or, and and a, and kind of a preservation during the race. The front wheel drive cars can't go 10 tenths on the brakes, so they'll burn them up. Rear wheel drive cars. They can use their brakes hard, but they may not be as quick down the straightaway, so they have to use their brakes and that sort of thing. So it's 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 it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting balance. And it's a fun balance. Yeah. The um, as far as uh, people might be interested in, in what uh, what the differences are between the street looking cars in uh, Continental Tire and the street looking cars in the Tudor. Uh, 
Rolex uh, series that runs under IMSA at the same weekends for the most part that we run. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the GT cars uh, and the Tudor series? The GT cars did start life and are based off of street cars. The, the differences are so, I mean, you're, you're dealing with a ton of technology, a ton of factory input when you're talking the GT LM class. Um, they, you know, you've got aerodynamics, you've got enhanced electronics, uh, you've got moved pickup points within reason, you've got bodywork that's flared out to the moon, you know, Two inches or three inches on each side is, is how much they're allowed to flare the bodywork and, and make changes subsequent to that. I mean, there's so much, while they do look similar, there is, it's a pure race car that is. So they can optimize the chassis. Exactly. Design, for example, you know, moving the suspension pickup points so that the suspension works we're, very we're, we're working with having to, to balance stock points and capabilities within the car, they can move stuff within, you know, within their rule book and, and create what they need to create. That's very interesting. Uh, the uh, speed-wise, uh, the GT and GS cars, uh, and lap time-wise, how close are they? I'm sure it differs by track. Well, top speed-wise, uh, yeah, it, it differs. For instance, at Daytona, actually, a GS car is as quick, if not maybe a, quick, a little bit quicker than some of the GT cars because we don't have the drag uh, from all the aerodynamics. But the lap times are 10 seconds at Daytona roughly and, and even more at other tracks. Different. And that's all because of, exactly, you know, you're taking a thousand pounds out of a car and you're taking and you're adding downforce and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, yeah, they're, Porsche 911 and, and GS and Porsche 911 and GT are Porsche 911s and they started out kind of on the same factory line but at one point they went their separate ways in the factory and yeah. So the GT car is is in part a, a downforce car, it's using a, a bigger combination of more aerodynamic grip uh, yeah. and a mechanical, mechanical grip. Yeah. And the yeah. GS car is, is much less so aero yeah. grip and much more when you, when, grip. Yeah, when you, when you, and, and when you look at the size of the tires, I mean, we're limited to a 275 tire in Grand Sport. And the, the GT cars run wide. I mean, they're, they're wide, wide 320 and 330. Really? You know, millimeter wide tires and that sort of thing. And plus, again, the factory development and the tire war that goes on in, in the GTLM class sort of thing really ups the, the ante. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, things that people who know about uh, the Phoenix uh, uh, American Motorsports team will um, historically will remember is that this team was very successful in the past running uh, a different kind of car, uh, an all-wheel drive uh, uh, car uh, made by Subaru. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between driving an all-wheel drive car uh, in the uh, uh, series and a rear-wheel drive uh, V8 car uh, in the series? To drive the different types of drive lines in these types of, you know, in this street-based car, like I said, you, you do your, your, what I like to say is you're, you're, you're driving around systems in the car. So you do have to take a different approach to driving it. Um, the all-wheel drive car is in some ways similar to a front-wheel drive car, in some ways similar to a rear-wheel drive car. Um, and that, uh, it's hard to, to really explain all the little intricacies, but it's, there are differences in, in feel where you have to do certain things with the car, more so take certain chances and that was also a factor of how much power the car made versus the other cars. It was an underpowered car but it handled it. Mm -hmm. the corners well because you had to drive and you had to just drive to its strengths. So you would optimize your driving style to maximize its its strong points and minimize the effects exactly. of its weak you know, points, the, the power. The Mustang doesn't corner as well but it goes down a straightaway so you're, you then, you know, your object is to make the straightaways as long as you can. Very good. Well, I, uh, 
you know, as we finish up, one of the things I'd be interested to hear from you is you know, how you see the you know, season evolving and, and uh, also looking further forward. How do you uh, how do you think about your own uh, driving career? Where, where would you like to see yourself uh, in, in driving uh, sports cars uh, in the next five years? So how do you see it the season has been a little bit of a challenge when we switched to the Mustang last year. We only ran a few races, and there's been so many changes going into this year that while a little bit of that applied, there's been a steeper learning curve because of the rule on shocks opening up um, has kind of made the car work again. Um, there was a spec shock. There was a spec shock that did not work for, did not work well at all. So it's, it's, you know, the first couple of races have been a little bit of a challenge um, with some mechanical issues and some contact taking us out of both races, um, none of which is kind of, you could say everything is avoidable, but there are some things in racing that the stars line up and that somebody does drop out, you know, comes off the road from nowhere and, and wipes you out of the track. Um, Exactly. You can't control everybody. You, you can try and control your own car as much as you can, and even still, sometimes you have a mechanical and a piece fails that you don't really expect to break. Um, so it's, it's that sort of thing. For me, driving-wise, um, driving in the GT championship cars, that would be, you know, that's, that's where I would like to be. Um, I like sports car racing, I like the challenge of endurance racing and that sort of thing. Although sprint racing in GT cars is also pretty cool, so you know, something like World Challenge is not. It's it's also appealing because it is, you know, they, there is, to me, there is something about running street-based cars, even though when you get into the GT cars, they're not really, they're not really dealing with the street characteristics anymore. Um, challenge and I think it's fine. I mean, you know, the open wheel and stock cars, you know, maybe on road courses, but the oval stuff doesn't appeal all that much. A different, a different set of skills, a different kind of car. Yeah, uh, and you know, oval, it's, it is, it is challenging I mean, running on ovals that we've run on, like for instance, Homestead, where, you, where the banking is a corner that you kind of got to go, okay, that's, that's, that's sucked it up and do this. But you also have to remember, you're driving a car that was never intended to go around them. So when you look at a, an NASCAR, you're saying, oh, that's, that's built and staggered to, to go left and, and through the banking yeah. at 180 miles an hour. So. Well, I really appreciate your taking the time, Andrew. It's, uh, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, we'll uh, try to keep more features uh, coming for uh, those who are interested in Phoenix American Motorsports uh, and Continental Sports Car, uh, Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge. Uh, thanks very much for being with us.